Okay, we are on the air. Um, good evening. Um, and tonight I welcome Frank Menser, one of the game designers at TSR during the Halcyon days of the early 1980s. He's, of course, best known as the author of the 1983 Red Box Dungeons and Dragons basic set. Frank will be launching his new Kickstarter, The Worlds of Imperia, on October 2nd. So welcome, Frank. Um, it is really a great privilege to talk to you tonight. Greetings, Marty. Thanks for the opportunity. I always like to talk to gamers of whatever stripe, whatever game, actually. So thanks for mentioning my golden oldie there, but uh, <laughs> let's talk about whatever you want and whatever you think your, your viewers and fans will want. Sure, absolutely. Um, of course, we want to uh, talk about you got a big Kickstarter coming up pretty soon, next couple weeks, um, October 2nd, and um, it's the Worlds of Imperia, and I know that first appeared in print in uh, some RPA tr RPGA tournament modules that were later compiled into I-12 and published under TSR. Um, what, um, how did the idea of creating a setting that was sort of separate from Greyhawk come about? Um, originally, what happened, and the document that we have is a simple inner office memo where Gary simply approves text to be used in a module slated for publication. Routine sort of approval, this sort of thing happened, you know, uh, several times a month uh, for our, based on our production schedule whenever anything went to print that involved different uh, intellectual properties, in this case a reference to the world of Greyhawk. Um, although the approval was routine and the memo was routine, the impact overall was that Gary explicitly approved this adventure of mine set in my campaign world as being on the world of Greyhawk, or at least that, that planet. Uh, it didn't take with it place within the world of Greyhawk setting, nor did it use any of the unique features of that great classic setting. Instead, this was all new, and it arose from my original campaign from Philadelphia back in the 70s. Uh, that particular write-up and that adventure we did was enacted by my gaming group in the 70s, but of course, what I wrote is the property and remains the property of TSR or whoever bought it now, Wizards of the Coast or Hasbro, whoever lawyer you talk to. I gotcha. So did you ever have, after sort of some of the publishing occurred, the RPGA modules and then I-12, did you ever have discussions with Gary about officially kind of including that content into Greyhawk or was it always just kind of going to be its own separate well, entity? Um, the campaigns are vastly different, and I did cover this with Gary in private discussion now and then. It never got to the point of, let's talk about the campaign set that we're going to release. Uh, this was always a future project and discussed in that tense, and then when things happened and Gary was no longer at TSR, it was just infeasible, and all of our plans got shelved, uh, basically. Um, so um, we didn't really talk about interaction because Gary very specifically wanted to stick with his campaign, this war game origins, a group of warring states, basically, mostly of human or humanoid composition uh, racially, but uh, on a very large continent and thus plenty of room for these individual city-states, much like city-state from Judges Guild was one large write-up. This was a bunch of smaller city-states in Gary's gaming. Mine, however, was born from this new concept of role-playing and fantasy worlds, borrowing a piece of Tolkien or uh, Stephen R. Donaldson or various you know, fantasy authors of the 70s, 80s, um, 70s at the time, and tossing them in willy-nilly into some campaign world. And it wasn't set up like Gary's. It wasn't city-states. It was just one realm with borderlands and wilderness and so forth all around it. Oh, cool. So it, you basically, you're very highly influenced by sort of that <laughs> quest literature of the time, you might say. Sure. But the the major difference is that my tech was starting with role-playing and the wonderful worlds, the D&D, &D, and then it later things like RuneQuest. RuneQuest was my second ever fantasy game, and it was the first viable skill system. D&D &D never did come up with that good a skill system until later, much later. Uh, and this work by Greg Stafford really influenced me early on in the 70s, and likewise then Traveler from Mark Miller, because I was had been a science fiction freak for over a decade at, this, at that point, dating back to high school days of the 60s. 
<laughs> yeah, Traveler. Everybody remembers the game where you die during character generation. <laughs> you can, and Mark uh, actually tilted it towards character death and ran a care gen setup at Gen Con 50, and it was hilarious. Just a good tongue-in-cheek poking at his own setup. In practice, though, in Traveler, yes, that could happen, but it came up so rarely. Or you could say, okay, just roll again, you know, just ignore that part, yeah. et cetera. Easy enough to do. I mean, I, I very much remember it's like, okay, you want to take that one term in the military so you don't quite die, but then jump into the scouts and maybe you'll get a scout ship or something. <laughs> yep, always, always a nice option. We were gaming it even then. We learned in the 70s how to game the systems as fast as they could crank them out. So that's the gamer mentality. Um, and you, you did mention uh, the Watts IP being uh, Imperial. Is there any concern that... There's going to be some mid-level uh, lawyer who feeling feeling his oats one day and and try to kind of come down on you for something that they, you know, have the rights to, especially with I-12. Yeah, this is uh, definitely a concern, and our point of view and our method how we're approaching this is we don't play with other people's toys. Uh, Egg of the Phoenix was something I wrote while at TSR that is theirs. We won't even refer to it. Uh, if folks on blogs or social media want to say, hey, where should we place Egg of the Phoenix? Well, then we can give them guidelines, but not officially speaking. Uh, no statement by our company and nothing in the product will refer to unique proprietary terms like this. For example, Gail Gygax, Gary's widow, has the undisputed right to use her husband's name and products and legacy. Uh, and to see for uh, pursue that as see she fit in future publishing endeavors, media, what have you. For me to make a big deal, I mean, it is a historical fact that I was Gary's aide, and we talked about this, but that's all I'm going to say. And in the uh, product itself, that's not our focus. That's a minor historical note up front, saying this is how this came about. Uh, also emphasizing that don't be looking for anything I wrote while at TSR. The material here started before I joined TSR in the 70s. Everything I wrote during that period and really generously throughout the 90s, including New Infinities, a subsequent company that I was at with Gary. Uh, anything I wrote during this period, we consider off limits. We are strictly sticking to things I have done mostly 1992 to present, because uh, that's the period in which I have run the Imperia campaign, although it dates back to 77 when it first got going. And there was this period when other people published things about Imperia, which I do not own, which we won't use. From 92 on, I started experimenting with this new medium, this new game room called a chat room. Um, and the same group of players has, for the most part, been playing for 25 years now, 26. And we're about to actually finish the Imperia campaign, get to the end of it and they'll decide whether to save the royals and the capital city and all the all that on their own they decide how the campaign will end up so we're anticipating that within the next six months or so but it's a just a plain vanilla chat room game always has been i played with roll 20 a little bit and a couple other of the new platforms they look great but we have been doing this for 25 years most of us are older guys we're used to the standard die roll uh, command in the plain vanilla chat rooms. So that's the way we're going to go out. 25 years or not, new state-of-the-art platforms or not, we're going to go out the same way we got started. Well, that's totally cool. Yeah, I can I can see that. And I remember playing on some of those AOL chat rooms and IRC channels and the, the, the early glory days of the Internet, as it were. Back then, in the early 90s, I was known as OGF Ogre, standing for the online gaming forums, OGF. Uh, that all, they threw all that out when Electronic Arts came to power with the computer games and that was the new trend, etc. So. Now you're talking about, um, you have of course all this historical, you know, content that you've had from playing this campaign, you know, essentially, you know, since the early days. Are, is this a lot of your note compilation or are you also sort of adding new, new stuff as you go, you know, today since this sure. has kind of been an ongoing thing. Are you revamping? Are you writing new content? Are you just really kind of gathering up all those old notes that you had from the previous games? 
Very fair question. Um, my campaign is a lot like Gary's Greyhawk, which is a lot like your home campaign, which is a lot like yours, you, the viewer watching this. It's a bunch of rough notes with jotted down ideas. Nobody actually sits down at home and writes it out in the full form like we presented to you when we published it from TSR. Uh, so most of the campaign is in that state and has been. A uh, brief flashback in 20, uh, 2012, I started another company called Eldritch Enterprises, which in the long run didn't work out. We had four great authors, but insufficient support staff to publish our stuff. So that's the long and the short of it for that. It was a shame. Uh, but during that time, we tried publishing two products from my home campaign called Lich Dungeon. Um, basically, my rationale was, why do you have a dungeon full of monsters? Well, somebody must be making money off of this. So the Lich, in this case, built the darn thing and put the word out on the dungeon grapevine or whatever to the other monsters, offered free food and water and, and even all the, the treasure they could keep from adventurers wandering through getting eaten. Uh, and so he built this 12-level setup. Uh, we tried publishing two levels of that and the amount of work turning my rough <coughs> notes into a publishable, respectable product, and they only came out barely respectable. See, it was just too much of a hurdle. And it was also trying to reach back into the 70s and relive that period. And I've been moving on constantly ever since that period, and I have all new stuff I want to say now and write about. So uh, dipping back into those old stories, those old leads, is only viable to a certain point. I'm sticking to describing the world, the setting, of Imperia rather than these individual adventures within it. That's up to you folks, the DMs. You can run whatever adventures you want in this. We're trying to make it a real easy learning curve, not too much, no immediate war with dragon-like monsters or something like this. You know, it's a nice plain vanilla world, but there is a lot lurking, a lot going on out there in the background once you're ready to tackle it. So uh, the introductory adventure inside of two hours, we think, or maybe even one, you'll feel like you know that your way around Imperia, what the big cities are, who's running things, and the general setup. Because you've been here, really, for years. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's it, it in a way, it harkens back to what I think of the old uh, <clears throat> sort of world of Greyhawk setting, where it kind of gives you a city, gives you a couple names of who the movers and shakers are, a brief description, but then kind of gives you a little bit of a blank slate in, you know, in that early uh, fold, map folio and whatnot. Right. Uh, one of the things we might try, for example, no promises, I believe in the power of game masters and their fast speed. Some of us as game masters like to prepare everything right down to the nubbies. And in a lot of the current game systems, especially 5.0, 3.5, or Pathfinder, you really need a lot of notes when it comes to the crunch, when you're ready to run the combat. But aside from the crunch, does a game master need everything split, spilled out for him? Do you ha really have to have read this to the player text? What if I just give you the highlights of what I want you to get across and let you go ahead and try the phrasing yourself? That could abbreviate in counter text down to micro size, which some people don't want. They want to fluff it up to make it bigger to get better sales. We have so much to say <laughs> that we're going to try abbreviated formats like this, I think, in some of the, the material we'll present. Trusting more in you, the game master. Excellent. So uh, it definitely sounds like it's it's very much like a sandbox setting, in that you're you're just sort of saying, here's where the here's where the woods laid out, but you have this big playground to play in, and I'm not gonna tell you what story you want to take, and I'm not gonna you're just gonna have this backdrop, and you can flesh it out as you see. That's basically it. What the the really bizarre thing that we're going to try and do is release this for about five to ten game systems at once. It is not multi-system. Any one set will be for 5E or for 1E or Beckme, the system I wrote. Um, but figuring out how to make that work and addressing and having experts on RuneQuest and on uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics and Swords and Wizardry and non-D&D &D tapes like RuneQuest, like I said, and also Savage Worlds. We're talking happily with Pinnacle. It's such a cool system. And maybe if we make one common world for everybody to play around in so you don't have to worry about the setting, you already know about the setting, Maybe it'll be easier to introduce, say, a starter set of rules for RuneQuest or DCC or SW so you can try different game systems. Take down that wall you've put up between your preferred system and those of other people. 
hey, we're a common hobby. We're all doing the same basic thing. I think these walls are artificial, a, a magnification of the minor differences between the systems. So this is part of that approach that we are going to try releasing this for many game systems at once to establish a common ground where we can all come together as hobby gamers. That's really cool. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, and I've, I saw that you have, uh, you're bringing on, or, or at least trying to bring on a lot of the old TSR folks, and you've mentioned um, several of them on the website. And I know uh, um, Darlene is confirmed, right? Because she's doing the maps, apparently, which is just right. Yeah, that is a stunning. I mean, you know, yeah, I'm, I, just, I still fanboy out when I see some of her roughs or what she's got done so far. Um, what I did basically was, uh, in addition to try and construct an easy to swallow, low learning curve setting, I decided to try bringing in a few friends of mine. Well, then, as soon as a few of them said yes immediately, then I started thinking, oh my gosh, have I opened a can of worms? Uh, people are going to say, why wasn't I invited? And okay, you're going to offend somebody. <laughs> yeah, uh, right now, our internal organization, if you will, of Loxley, the company driving this, uh, of which I'm the head. Uh, so I'm, uh, the buck stops here. If you have any questions, just come to me. Um, but in-house, as it were, uh, we have Darlene doing the maps and also managing the entire art program. This includes half a dozen artists working on dedicated projects for this, in addition to the guest stars that are going to be arriving later. Uh, people that uh, we hope to get confirmation on one note. Earlier, I had uh, glibly hoped to get a whole slew of artists, and one has unfortunately bowed out, mostly apparently for reasons of age, and that he just doesn't do this anymore and hasn't for like 20 years. And that's Jim Holloway. So uh, please respect his wishes uh, and don't bother him as we won't and support <laughs> his life choices and so forth. But I do have very high hopes for virtually everybody else on the list that was leaked early on. Can I release more names at this point? Well, not really. We're in the process of deciding how to release the names. There are so many of them. Because at this point, the entire Imperia project involves 35 people. And only about 10 of them are in-house, as I say. Only 10. Yeah, it's a mid-sized company, just kabang, that we threw together. Nobody is a full-time employee except for me and my uh, creative aid. And Darlene is pretty much doing this full time at this point. Um, it's an experimental corporate setup in that we'll all come together, blend our skill sets, and talk about things a lot and see what kind of a dynamite program we can come up with by synergizing, by sharing ideas. I'm going to these artists saying, I don't know what the buildings look like. I'm open to discussion. Go ahead and dream stuff up. Let's you help shape Imperia. And in the same way, in a future project, we hope to make Imperia or multiple Imperias with the different game systems available for you, the fan, the DM, the player, to write up a little chunk of it, send it to us, have it reviewed by a jury, it's called, of your peers, other gamers, not the paid suits or anything, and say, yes, we've decided that in the 5e world of Imperia, that this one little hex here has this farm and an inn and things like that. And that was submitted by Joe from uh, North Carolina. And here's his photo and a little bit of his gaming background. You, the everyday gamer who makes up this great hobby, can actually help build these worlds in their online versions. Uh, we're really jazzed about this concept, this possibility, that then Game Master's running events and uh, adventures in this setting can just go look at what their fellow DMs designed in the area where their character, their adventuring party, is passing through. Maybe even pass off part of it for Joe to DM as a guest DM using Roll20 or some other platform. I mean, the possibilities for gaming in the new age are just so tremendous, and that's the intention behind the whole Imperia setup to give it very low cost, as low as we can get it, to the companies, to the fans, for you to play with, a common world. That's, that's totally cool. I, I, I've heard a little bit about, this sounds like uh, what people are calling the West Marches style of play, where everybody, you have a group of players and you have a group of DMs, and just everybody says, this is what I want to kind of do this week, and this is what I want to kind of do this week, and then somebody says, okay, I'll DM, and then you just go and go to that guy's game, and then maybe it's a different guy's the next week. That 
that's a very interesting concept. And especially with, like you said, with the technology, you know, yeah. the, the sky is literally the limit in a way. Now, another project I have within the next two years is establishing a global nonprofit company with a global database capable of handling 10 or 20 or 50 million gamers who log in choosing a screen name, don't give us personal info, that makes it a hack target, but <laughs> using a screen name, go through, it'll take you hours and give us your opinion of hundreds thousands of different games, accessories, adventures, the works, and then provide a means where you can get in touch with somebody in Great Britain or India or Japan or down under in Oz and actually conduct games online, work out the timing, what time zone you're in, you know. Uh, there are times when I get online in the morning and chat with my European friends. It's a standard part of my procedure. I'd like to see more of us as gamers with that global outlook move into that mindset. Oh, yeah, I play a game every Saturday at like 11 a.m. because it ties into Australia here and Japan here, and it's the coolest thing you've ever seen. You know, visions of the future. It's going to take us a while to get there. Why haven't we already seen this? Because we've relied on game companies, I think, subconsciously to take the wheel, to drive our hobby. They're the ones producing all the games that we're buying, whether it's guys with day jobs, some of my favorites who are producing cool third-party materials, we call it, uh, not a great term, uh, but folks who just want to contribute in some way. Uh, great games like Hyperborea by my Je friend Jeff Delanian out of New England. He's got a day job, does other things, but he's devoted himself to this cool old school version, all new game system that he developed. Or you can be Conan and in the Conan world of Hyperborea, or be non-Conan, some other tack of this great, uh, great classic literature. And this sort of stuff and a dozen others wouldn't exist without these passionate people who want to write and create. We got to get the word out that this stuff is cool, that this is out there, and here's where you go find it. And once again, a global nonprofit, a place for us all to talk to one another, to find one another, and find the future together is something I hope for. I might not get there, but I'm going to try to reach for it. Well, then that, this is a, a call out to any of those uh, wealthy gamers out there who want to fund stuff like this. <laughs> The yeah. idea is to actually make it a bona fide nonprofit so anybody can write off their donation and you don't have to give the overhead to a crowdfunding mechanism. So, yeah. like I say, that's a year or two down the line. At the moment, there are some excellent nonprofits benefiting, for example, game designers who've hit hard times. My friend Sean Patrick Fannin is involved in managing that particular one. Uh, I wish I had the link that I could give you offhand. But there are certainly wonderful activities and groups out there. The idea with a global nonprofit would be to find these groups and plug them in first and build from that, not to move in and say, we got a better idea, move over. No, not at all. Build from the roots that are there. It only really works as a grassroots effort. Sure, absolutely. I wanted to just do a quick sidebar um, for, for some of the younger viewers who might not be as familiar with the, the work. Um, look for this online. Darlene's maps were in this lovely little folio. And uh, if you Google the World of Greyhawk folio, you, you can see some of her amazing cartography. I mean, I, I have two copies myself because I want to put one on the wall and the other one is, you know, f laying flat in a, in a safe place <laughs> for posterity, as it were. I, I don't, I'm going to go ahead and impulsively, we're getting along real well, Marty, and I'm going to drop two names on you. Uh, Darlene is handling the big maps, the map, okay? We have, to, we have invited, and uh, these two folks have accepted our invitation to join our internal team of producing the rest of the maps. And these are world-class celebrities uh, such as Alyssa Fadden, for maps has agreed to join the team. And uh, in thinking about, I think I'm going to hold off mentioning the other one, but is a 3D visualization expert that will make our maps just come alive and, and be actual images from Imperia. So oh, excellent. Uh, we're looking for Anna's work in the future, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah, I love that there's a lot of um, guys who are doing a lot of the sort of orthogonal view stuff or, or the sectional cutaway maps where you can kind of get a view of the, the building or the structure, but it also has, you know, isometric or some other stuff. I love that stuff. <clears throat> now, I, I first proposed the isometric to uh, artist Steve Sullivan 
in the first of the RPGA modules called To the Aid of Fogs. And that is the first published DSR product that has a 3D representation of the dungeon. This then was expanded very quickly into the classics of the 80s, like the Ravenloft and uh, Dragonlance and other, mm -hmm. you know, mega lines. And, of course, then moving into the realms, etc. You know, that this became a standard method. Proud to say the TSR artists developed this for RPGA stuff back in the very beginnings. <clears throat> Excellent. Now, you've told us a little bit about what is uh, intended to be in the box set. You know, we have, um, like, a book... The, a, player booklet or GM booklet, some maps. Can you sneak preview anything else that, that might be kind of a fun surprise or, or do we have to wait, you know, for another week and a half or so? <laughs> um, we will, of course, when we launch the Kickstarter, have a full description of all components, price, the whole nine yards. Uh, we are lucky that the response to this has been such, given the list of names of celebrities you mentioned earlier, we're fairly confident in fairly large sales, and as a direct result of that, we are um, really going full speed ahead on these different aspects uh, of absolute top quality, aiming for the best you'll see in physical quality from Wizards or Paizo or various other top-notch fantasy flight, you know, the, the current state of the art. Uh, for the printing uh, technology. Unfortunately, I blanked on the meat of your question. I'm sorry. I wandered <laughs> off on you there, Marty. No, that's all right. Uh, just, uh, just asking if there's any sneak preview you could kind of give us uh, yeah. that you haven't necessarily announced yet. But Yeah. But we'll we, um, we are aiming at a box set because there's got these two maps. The, it'll be folded maps like the Greyhawk box set. We are hoping to get Jeff Easley to design a box that looks like a big heavy tome, not the same as Greyhawk, but using that theme, that idea. Uh, but this is a very different set. It's not wargaming states in conflict. It's a different campaign. So the artwork will reflect that. Uh, we are at inviting people in, not just from the D&D uh, halls of fame, but people like uh, Liz Danforth, the uh, artist for the second ever role-playing game, Tunnels and Trolls, you know, early 70s. And she is still producing, still working uh, with Ken St. Audrey on that and various products, and we're very proud to reach out to folks like that. This will have uh, what we call perfect bound, not hardback books. If it were like those ad and books behind you, when you sell them by yourself, hardback is fine, but when they're in the box set, you go with the softer covers. Sure. Uh, full color throughout what we call bleed. In other words, the color's running right to the edges, not stopping with a half-inch margin like on your home laser printer or something. Uh, using the full capacity of state-of-the-art printing, uh, state-of-the-art uh, artistry and, and product design, the whole works. I want to put in, and it costing looks feasible, imitations of the original little brown booklets that we found in the original brown and white OD&D set, the original set. But in this case, giving you life paths for your character that you could follow any of these three, that's the initial concept. Just pick up a booklet and it fills you in on your background, how your character's got to, and what you're looking for in the future, what your options are for adventuring. You were waving, waving a hand? <laughs> yeah, well, no, just for those, again, young, younger viewers in the audience, although I'm not sure how Google is going to switch back and forth between us, but mm. uh, these, there's the early box set up sitting mm -hmm. behind me. Um, and I, and those, those great little, little, we call them the LBBs, the little brown booklets, uh, just that tan, really, color. But if we can just imitate that format with a two-color front cover and uh, the brown textured things, and they seem suitable for certain very pragmatic components in the set, uh, these guides to how to get started, you know, a basic guide to this and that. So I can't limit it to just two, two or three main booklets of explanation and the little brown booklets for the specific things that we might end up tossing a lot more stuff in. We'll see how the Kickstarter goes. Well, I'm, I'm excited for it personally. I mean, it'll be really cool to see what kind of stretch goals you, you got going after that. Um, what we've been advised is to not count on physical stuff for the stretch goals. Yeah, uh, absolutely. With, uh, digital products, additional bonus material, and this and that, but not something that I have to send off to China, wait for three months to have printed after spending two or three months to produce. You know, go for a lighter, faster, easier approach on things like that. Yeah, yeah. One, well, and, and, you know, of course, what a lot of new Kickstarter people always run into is they don't realize how much 
extra postage they're adding, how much extra cost. You know, they they promise all these great stretch goals, but they realize they have now in the hole. And instead of this super successful Kickstarter, they've now run themselves into a bankruptcy practically. And uh, we are taking a tip from our good friends at Chaosium, who we are talking to weekly about the details of a RuneQuest version of this, one of my old favorite games, and I'm really excited to branch out into non-D&D stuff. You know, we've seen D&D &D dominate for so many years, and I'm happy to help facilitate a greater awareness and maybe even get people to try a basic RuneQuest by way of the Imperia setup. Uh, but but dealing with them, uh, we, we have very high hopes in terms of the components and, and the quality here that we're going to be able to offer. Excellent. Well, that's really great. <clears throat> um, let's see, what do I have for the period? I, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, your historical role simply because I couldn't possibly have you on and talk to you without, you know, asking you the same questions that I'm sure you've gotten a million times before. Um, I go to a lot of game conventions, and I just love talking to gamers of all sorts, because I am a gamer. This is how I started. I was a starving artist in the 70s, and I wandered into a dynamite job at TSR, and the rest ended up like it did. But, yeah, I go back to my roots, hobby gaming, tabletops. Yeah, and I want to do, you know, again, for some of our people who came into the game post-second edition, third edition, fourth edition, and whatnot, you know, um, kind of have you talk a little bit about how you came into TSR and how you ended up on the basic set project, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and especially, uh, you know, AD&D had been out since, I guess, was 77, 78, and, uh, and the, the last book was published around 81, I would say, Dungeon Master's Guide, um, and then the, your, uh, the Red Box set came out. Of course, uh, we had the um, home set and the, the mold base set before yours, and then you recompiled and, and rewrote a whole bunch, and you came out with the 83 box set. And what, uh, without stepping all over your story, right. <laughs> what, what kind of brought you to that, that moment? Um, it all started back in the 60s when I was like 10 to 12 years old and really got into the Battle of Gettysburg and other war games that were brand new and outfit uh, called Avalon Hill out of Baltimore, and I was grew up in Philadelphia, so this was you know just a couple hours away. Um, and I just got hooked on the strategic aspects. Played some miniatures gaming through then. Um, in 1974, of course, uh, Gygax and Arneson's created Dungeons and Dragons, and a new era was born, really, of cooperative gaming. All the gaming to that point for thousands of years. How many thousand depends on your faith. Uh, but uh, for all this time, human civilization, all the games were competitive. The sports were competitive. Mankind is competitive. It's a way we, it's in our genes. Uh, and suddenly they came up with a way to tell fairy tales, basically, but in a cooperative group setting with a little bit of structure and some dice. And so we have Gary and Dave and the first five, actually, who built TSR, people like uh, Mike Carr and Tim Cask. Uh, Dave Sutherland, the first art, great artist there in those early days. And people like John Eric Holmes came along and volunteered to rewrite the rules so it was more understandable. Tom Mulvey and I started TSR in 1980 on the exact same day. And uh, his job was to write that. My job was to learn something and then be useful. Okay. Uh, and I, I took the uh, assignment most seriously and ended up then... Uh, uh, being tapped in late 1980, uh, I had stood out so much and stuck my head up so much and took enough risks. They asked me to start a game club that Mike Carr had described called the RPGA or Role Playing Game Association. I uh, did that for nearly two years, and then Gary, uh, we, Gary and I had gotten close by that time. I had played in an, uh, some games of the Greyhawk campaign at his house and so forth. Luckiest guy on earth, coming from Philadelphia, nobody, and all of a sudden I'm gaming with Gary Gygax. Yeah, I mean, that, you, that's totally um, speaking out at that, that time. And he broke it to me gently. He said, I need to pull you from the RPGA. Okay, boss, what's up? And I need to put you to work rewriting Moldvay's basic and uh, Cook Marsh expert. And I was kind of, okay, disappointed. Two reasons. AD&D was rocking. That had come out in 77 to 79, and we had just hired this a tremendous new talent named Hickman. Uh, we weren't <laughs> sure if it was a guy or a gal, somebody named Tracy, you know. Uh, it turned out Tracy and R are good friends of mine now, and yes, a married couple, but we had to sort them out there by the names on the memos. 
uh, and he has this this Dragonlance thing and this idea for a vampire story and all kinds of great stuff is happening in the advanced D&D &D realm. So it was all oh, jeepers, Gary. I got to write uh, that. Why? Uh, that, that takes me out of the loop on all this cool stuff. And he explained that the flagship, the real long runner he felt was the basic game that the advanced game would be more for tournaments or technical aspects when you needed that much more crunch basically we didn't call it crunch then but that's that's the idea and he convinced me that he not only wanted to do this he wanted me to do the best i could and create an entire viable game system and extrapolate from the basic stuff that they had laid out previously the original set then Holmes, and then the great Mulvey and Cook Marsh right before me, and rewrite them. And I still wasn't sure why rewrite it. He said, well, this is confidential. We explained some contracts that had been landed and global distribution coming up in multiple languages. Uh, the result, of course, if you can see this, this is actually the small UK version, but good old red box with the iconic Larry Elmore art and so forth. Uh, on it. Yep. And he's got the shirt on there. Uh, yeah. And this proceeded, the line proceeded to sell about 50 million copies in 14 different languages. So uh, that's the best seller of all the editions of D&D, &D, even to this day. Times are a lot different. We have so many other cool games to play. Back yeah. then, there weren't that many others. There were some, and over at TSR, we played all of them. But uh, we weren't just hardcore D and D. I continued playing RuneQuest and Traveler and a couple others. But that's basically my story. In 1986, Gary had been uh, ousted from TSR. I hung tight until he asked me to leave, and I tried to help him with a new company that didn't work for lack of funding, basically. Uh, and then I got out of the game industry. So long story. Uh, and your takeaway is this. I showed up in 1980, got a couple of the greatest hits, including Temple of Elemental Evil, the RPGA, the Red Box series, and then I waltzed off to go do other things. And people who've been in the trenches the whole time, like Ed Greenwood or Rick Loomis of Flying Buffalo with Tunnels and Trolls, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all these people are the true founders who have been exhibiting at every Gen Con since the early 70s. And, uh, you know, uh, who am I? I was a latecomer who got a couple of plum jobs. So I ask everybody listening to this to share my respect for those who actually built this city that we all live in and are having such a cool time nowadays while supporting the independent publishers, the guys who aren't suits, the guys who have day jobs at Boeing, like Peter Atkinson, who now owns Gen Con, he was a suit mid-range at Boeing. You know, so gamers will show up everywhere. So just fight the good fight, keep playing the games, and uh, remember the community. Okay? That's my core message. <laughs> Excellent point. Uh, and and that's, that's very interesting that, like you said, you kind of came in late, but you managed to somehow get on some really plum projects, and now you have a pretty significant legacy, I think, but for a lot of people, you know, just because... That red box is so iconic in over the history, you know. I mean, you know, we have all the other icons too. Some of them behind me, but um, yeah. very, you know, it, it's funny. One of my, he would he would hate for me not to mention this, but one of my gamers in my group, his five year old daughter is named Alina. Okay. <laughs> uh, just, the, yes, I uh, had to kill off the cleric Alina in the red box because. That was one thing Gary and I firmly agreed on, that if you know the characters can die, you will get a little less attached to them. Uh, it's very cool developing character background and being super immersed and attached to a character, as long as you then, when you play a high-risk adventure, play another character, you know, who you can <laughs> afford to lose. <laughs> well, and, and I think what's kind of maybe a funny side effect to that decision is that in a way you made a very iconic hero who who dies in helping the the player mm -hmm. and that made a i think made a pretty big impact on those people who played that early adventure you know that that was like a it, it made the villain truly feel you know villainous you know it wasn't just like okay we're gonna have a happy ending and everything's it's like oh we're gonna kill that character who's been mentoring you and helping you along in some way if we have the time, real briefly, what I hear the same story in Italy, Japan, down under. 
Frank, we don't really play the game you wrote much anymore. We've grown up, become doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, literally a guy from India, a CEO, he is the chief, uh, uh, et cetera. And these are generally people who say to me, but something happened when we sat down with the Red Box and we made friendships, some of which have lasted for decades. We discovered things about the way our heads work. We can hear somebody describe something and we're plotting ballistic trajectories and the amount of cover we have from different directions. This is advanced visualization techniques. We are expressing our desires and our characters' desires, but then learning compromise and a path ahead that benefits everybody. These are the sort of things that you want in life skills, in job skills. And it turns out this simple cooperative game brings that all out of us. So gamers like you tell me, I don't really play the game much, but it changed my life. And now me, my name got tacked onto the side of the memory. I happen to be <laughs> the one who wrote some of the words, but it's the experience and that shared thing that you discover in these friends that you carry forth with and the, you watch for it, you live for it, part of yourself for the rest of your life. You're absolutely right about that. I mean, it, it's funny when you think, but when I think back to some of my closest friends, you know, a lot of them were met through gaming, you know, or or a connection somehow, connected somehow to the to the gaming. Um, and, you know, in, coincidentally enough, my, my I, went, I met my wife because because of gaming in a way. Um, I knew her through other things, but then she saw D&D on my shelf and she said, oh, that's cool. And I was like, okay, I gotta ask her out. <laughs> Any girl that thinks D&D is cool, <laughs> it's gotta yeah, be a really. good one. Yeah. Now, in the early days, of course, we had very few uh, females. And when Tim Cass, good friend of mine, came back into the hobby in the mid aughts after a 20 year absence, his first comment was, where did all these women come from? And what do you mean Gen Con has daycare? Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a wonderful hobby. It's grown to accommodate our the full breadth of our lives, not just the geek guys hiding in the basements anymore. Um, okay, great. Well, and, and I'm going to ask you a couple other, just my own sort of geeky questions, because I had these funny curiosities about some things. Um, <clears throat> in the early D&D, &D, um, you know, like you said, uh, AD&D &D was, was really big, and then you, uh, Gary and you had... The D and D is a separate line, and then you know apparently you he was telling you rewrite basic and expert, but of course, did you realize that it would kind of continue beyond that? That you would you know go to champions and mortals, you know, kind of run all the way up through whatever it is level thirty or um, at the time. Yeah, thirty six, and that was the crucial mistake. We should have kept it around fifteen to twenty. And in retrospect, if I were to do it over, I'd say, well, we're using a D twenty. Let's cap it at twenty. You know, everything would have been nice, numerological, and symmetrical, <laughs> and all that. Um, actually, my proudest achievement in that line is the third one, the D&D Companion set, the sort of bluish-green one. Mm -hmm. uh, because for the first time, I was able to describe how you run a realm, a barony, a dukedom, a fief. Uh, here's how you build the castle. Here's how you make money off of that. The whole system of rulership I got a chance to describe. And in addition, I got to refer to wargaming, mass battles, with a number crunching system that the DM can find out, okay, this mass battle will probably go like this, even analyzing the different swings, and these guys are better trained and they'll outlast them, but then can replay the battle from to the scratch with the character's point of view and describing it from that point of view because he's already crunched the numbers for the background of that army over there or these troops over here and the breakthrough moments that's how that system uh, is supposed to be used so for the first time things that we'd heard about what's a barbican i don't know but it costs 40 gold pieces gary said <laughs> so you know uh so that sort of thing and putting it all together for yes yeah, step by step this is how you do it uh, they did indulge me in Immortals. Gary had already been ousted by the time I did most of that. And Immortals is mostly unplayable. To start with, you have PowerPoints and you can cast any magic spell in the system. So for openers, learn all the magic spells in the entire game system. And <laughs> then, you know, but this is what Immortals would be doing. I couldn't figure out a way to abbreviate that. What the Immortal set really is, is a peek behind the curtain uh, with the wizard. Looking behind the scenes at the things that will go on in my head in the way I designed this whole setup, the entire rule system, about 
not gods, but immortal beings who get mistaken for gods, and the other planes of existence and the entire universe or multiple universes out there. So that's what Immortal Set talks about, really, the stuff behind the scenes that you don't think about until you do get into higher level play in that system, and you're out there trucking around in the outer planes and trying to take out the super big bad guy who's destroying whole, you know, planetary systems, not just um, critters. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And uh, along the same lines of getting a peek behind the curtain, race as class. Was there a debate about that when you were rewriting uh, the the basic set to to maybe Not branch out? Of. Yeah, that Gary had that covered right away. He said, "No, that's for advanced, where we take the different races and subdivide the options like mad." For the basic game, race as class is the way it started. That's a hallmark of that design. Uh, even various systems like RuneQuest that came up soon thereafter got off of that, but that remained one of these cornerstone characteristics. Clunky uh, or not, simple or not, I've met uh, plenty of players, especially kids, who, sure, I'll play an elf. It's a nice packetized, easy to understand, get rolling right away, you know, package. Instead of, okay, I start with an elf, and then do I want to be a wizard or a thief or a fighter? You know, the advanced method. Too many options for the beginning player. So it still works for that races class. Uh, and through that simplification, it also puts more focus on what you, the player, are providing to the role. Uh, the characterization, the voices maybe, the favorite weapon, whatever gimmicks you develop, then they become uniquely yours without having to worry about all those crunch things about the different classes and details that a dwarf could be or an elf or what have you. Excellent, excellent. So <clears throat> you, and you touched upon this after, uh, of course, uh, Gary was ousted from TSR and then you moved on and you worked with him um, a little bit you said it, uh, Infinite D, I think, was the name of the publishing company? New Infinities, or N I P I, Nippy, uh, New Infinities Productions, Inc. Um, and that was the mythos? Funded. I had a chance to work directly with the uh, late, great Don Turnbull, the first member of the Adventure Gaming Hall of Fame, editor of uh, Fiend Folio, et cetera. That was a great time for that, that point of view. Okay. Was that the mythos system, the uh, Dangerous Journeys and whatnot? Mythos was published right after that. Um, uh, the Dangerous Journey system was published by Game Designers Workshop. And uh, when I heard that, when Gary mentioned a couple things, and I saw his manuscript for Necropolis, the uh, Egyptian-based adventure, which is dedicated to me, I said, hey, uh, boss, uh, I thought we were going to work on this game system. And he had, we had a chat. He explained that the person who ousted him from TSR, who I call the POG, the person ousting Gygax, uh, and we just skip over the actual name. But she was lobbying lawsuits, and she was looking for ways to take him down, because really the only thing that could have taken TSR down then was Gary himself. And the chat we had was that he told me he would put my friendship and my personal welfare ahead of his game needs. And if I wanted out and he recommended that I get out because it was going to get too dangerous, he would work with Mr. Dave Newton, another designer and a, a good writer, et cetera. And I still am in touch with Dave through Facebook nowadays. But so Dave Newton is co-author of the Mythos book and the Dangerous Journeys game system because my friend Gary said, why don't you go have a life and let me continue fighting the pog and see what happens. As we know, he unfortunately lost that battle too. But I'll always remember that Gary put my welfare first and said, no, I can find other people to write. I think you ought to lay low here. The 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 incoming fire is getting pretty intense, basically. Gotcha. And then um, and then you had said you got out of gaming for a while. Um, and, and I had read online that you ran the bakery with your wife and and did some other sort of uh, other business uh, prospects and whatnot. But what sort of led you back to tackle Imperia now to be like, okay, I really want to, you know, <laughs> get into something big and do, you know, a big crowdfund and, and sure. Whatnot. Um, yeah, it's appropriate. My people will yell at me if we don't finish with Imperia here. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, although I'm a gamer, like, as you see, I'll, I'll tell gaming stories and wander and talk about the old days all you want. Um, I didn't get out of gaming per se. I just got out of that doing that for a living. Um, and I was writing resumes at one point, and I had a publishing house, uh, non-gaming, 
uh, got into a, an engineering firm which supplies ink handling hardware for the big web presses. At the time, it was things like Time, Newsweek, magazines like this. That era is also passed. Uh, but then in the mid-aughts, um, we I was managing, doing the business side of a commercial bakery in the Wisconsin Northwoods. My wife was hiring and training all the bakers, designing all the products, and I was eating too many of these, as I will tell you what happened. Uh, but during the mid-aughts, in the 2000s, I started getting phone calls, and afterwards we pieced together what happened. It had been 20 or 25 years since some of my greatest hits had been published. People were remembering due to numerology, oh, 20 years later, 25, and I started getting invited back to game conventions. So as that activity increased, I called up some friends and we tried to start uh, Eldritch Enterprises in 2012. There I've already mentioned briefly, but with Jim Ward, Tim Kask, and Chris Clark, three other great writers, we didn't have anybody to do the production side, and then we, we didn't have enough investment money, so that really didn't work out. We were stuck with nothing but uh, DTRPG or drive through publishing, uh, which is not bad. It addresses a vital need in our hobby, but we were aiming a little higher than that or hoping to for the physical products and things like that that we wanted to first release. So that kind of wound down, and I took my time. I had a heart attack during that period because of my bad eating habits, managing an all-natural, all-butter bakery for eight years. Yeah. Um, and having that for breakfast and lunch every day, yeah, that, that'll really pile up the cholesterol. Don't do that. Okay, <laughs> very bad, very bad. Um, and I thought about it and realized that I needed to tackle it by myself. And as much as I love my good friends, Jim Ward and Tim Kask especially, and Chris Clark, who worked with Gary during his last final years and produced uh, his Legendary Adventures games. So, you know, the, we all had this close Gary connection. But I needed to just bring together some people who weren't other great writers like this and just focus on my ideas for a change. So that led to starting Loxley, the basic company, to protect all my IP and intellectual properties and all that. Uh, and at this point, uh, like I say, a dozen or more people working for and with Loxley to produce the Imperia set first and several other projects down the line. Uh, we are really tackling a lot here with Imperia, but to narrow it down, the box set, the Kickstarter, will be released in your game system, whether you prefer 5th edition D&D or 3.5 or Pathfinder or Savage Worlds or RuneQuest. I want to release it with all the crunch, all the monsters, the NPCs, designed in nothing but that game system for the set you buy. So you don't have a bunch of other game system stats to wade through. You don't have a moldy system mess to deal with. You don't have generic where you got to do all the work. No, none of that. It's your 5E set or your 2E set or what have you. But from there, we know how we're going to do it. The costing looks good. We're inviting in a lot of people, great people like um, artists and writers from the history of D&D. I had a visions once of a Sergeant Pepper Beatles sort of thing with Gary and Dave. And then who are the other two Beatles? Well, obviously, John Eric Holmes and then Tom Mulvey, the four first authors of the first D&D sets. Once again, I'm an also ran who showed up later. So, you know, thinking along this line and trying to address the history, the community, as well as provide a top quality product. So that's what we're going to try and do. Release it for your game system in time for next year at Gen Con, released next summer. I uh, can't say exactly what date we're going to ship. A lot depends on Chinese printers and the weather for the shipping containers and stuff like that. But to give us plenty of time to make absolutely certain that we hit everything on the nose, look for it next summer and look for it ideally at the booth of your favorite game manufacturer Here's Imperia for this system. And then over there, there's Imperia for that system, maybe with castles for everybody. Who knows? But looking at this as a way to get you to go look at these other game systems, these other gamers, and realize just look up from your game of choice, and you'll find a whole community here ready to support you, trade ideas, and that you can all grow together. That's the overall thrust. Excellent. Well, that, that's really exciting. I mean, you know, there's so many great... <coughs> OSR systems and like you said, oh, yeah. the, and then there's the Rune Quests and I love Savage Worlds as well. We have played uh, oh. Savage Worlds and Origins yeah. and it's been fantastic. So 
you're going to probably, you might hook me for more than one set. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if we get this far, how to Imperia itself, the setting, changes when it becomes redesigned to emanate RuneQuest or Savage Worlds vibe or Dungeon Crawl Classics. The DCC one, we already know, it'll occur after the fall of Imperia itself. And there are these dungeons, and you're exploring the relics of this old civilization. You're not playing in the live campaign itself. Uh, versus in Castles and Crusades, you're at the height of the Imperial realm, you know, in the prime years, you know, et cetera, oh, wow. et cetera. No, that's a, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, I take all the different hist historical time frames and, you know, kind of set it as a to the background of the mechanics that you're working with. And one of the big kickers, and we're almost out of time, but the world doesn't stop at the atmosphere. There's stuff out there in orbit in other nearby uh, worlds. This is just one of several planets going around a star. What if the next planet over, you have an ultra-modern, high-tech society with no medieval stuff at all? And what happens when they start to interface? Do you do the prime directive solution, no touching, or mm -hmm. what? You know, what about the smugglers who are going to sneak in? So all of that, we're going to open all these doors with the Imperia setting. Uh, excellent. Well, that that is really exciting sounding. And and uh, so for those of you watching, again, this is going to come out uh, probably about a week before the big Kickstarter. So keep an eye out on that. October 2nd is our targeted Kickstarter launch date, and the uh, that'll run for a month. And then the release date, once again, will be next summer in time for Gen Con 51. Excellent. Um, and before you leave, uh, what is the one thing, and I know you talked a lot about uh, <clears throat> how technology and, and other advancements are kind of influencing gaming and, and, and enhancing it. What's, like, probably the one thing for in the history of your time as a game designer that either really for you signifies a, a sort of a game changer for the hobby, <laughs> pun unintended, um, in, you know, in terms of, you know, obviously the internet, but is there any one technology there like, not only was this a game changer in the recent past, but what's the, what do you think is going to be your, what's your future excitement? What's the thing you're like, oh, that's going to be really cool when, when the technology advances in a year or two or what, whatnot? Uh, I've been seeing a lot of progress on the um, um, digital platforms that we can get together and play games. I think that's going to explode even more. Better aids to visualization, better toolkit packages for your game system. Uh, we're way beyond just dice rollers here. You know, uh, a lot of great graphic aids. My personal uh, breakthrough uh, actually was when I believe it was Jordan Weissman with WizKids introduced pre-painted plastic figures from Asia. Huh. I grew up with in an era where I bought metal to melt down in my kiln to pour into molds to cast my own miniature <laughs> figures, cut off the flange, do a terrible job at painting them, and use them on sand tables. Okay, So the, being able to get a pre-painted complete figure right out of the box was just mind blown. Okay, <laughs> given my personal past, uh, that was my personal epiphany. There. Do you play on the grid, or are you still kind of theater of the mind? Um, we are definitely theater of the mind because, and I use a rule modified ultra fast system. Uh, we look at so much of any given rule system is devoted to slicing and dicing, combat, and in my campaigns, there's so much more that goes on other than combat. Sure, absolutely. That that we get into a lot of those things instead. Sure, we have combat. Um, in my campaign that I have been running for the last 25 years, you can imagine the kind of power they toss around. So r anything involving force, okay, they're toasted. That's the inevitable end result unless they're immortal. They're toasted. They'll take them out, whoever they are. So. Excellent. Well. Changes the game. Yeah, it does. It does. When you're playing at that high level, and actually, I don't. The, one of the reasons I don't really play at that high level because it kind of goes all out the window and gets a little crazy almost. Um, well, but, my my group of characters successfully negotiated an international treaty. They had to figure out who the bad guys were, trying to bring it down. Uh, they had to restore the reputation of one guy who had been in unjustly accused. So that turned into a whole squirrely sub adventure. Uh, but all added up that they uh, righted the realm. 
uh, when you're this level, when you're super high level, you're like the superheroes, the X-Men or the Avengers dealing with the president. You know, you, you you don't go out and just beat up some guy in an alley just to, to, to relieve yourself, right? Yeah, that's, true. You, that's true. You deal with world level, change, world changing and, and mega events like this. And that's the way my campaign runs, too. Well, Frank, it has been an absolute pleasure. I don't want to hold you any longer. It's been a great talk, um, and I'm, I'm so glad that you guys reached out and, <clears throat> and uh, that Mike reached out to me because uh, um, this is a real opportunity for me for a lifetime to, to chat with one of, you know, one of the icons in the industry. Oh, and <laughs> there you go again. Marty, it's been fun. Thank you very much. Be glad to come back again sometime. Absolutely. Well, best of luck with the quick Kickstarter, and you know, maybe I'll drop you an email and, and after this huge success, and you can tell me how exciting it was to run this this great uh, this great new product of yours. Yeah, hope so. We'll see. All right. Well, thank, thank you very you much. much. See you later, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, Marty and Frank out. <laughs>